and welcome to PlayStation Access, coming to you from Gamescom. Now, I'm very, very excited, and I know I always say that, but I am extremely excited because sitting next to me is none other than, and he's got an amazing name, Richard Bozhamovsky. Very good. Yes, <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> Who is a producer on Cyberpunk. And also very excited. Me. Also yeah. very excited. <laughs> We're both very excited. <laughs> So you're going to tell me everything I need to know about Cyberpunk, right? You're going to yes, spill all the secrets? Yes, everything. I will tell you everything. Okay, fantastic. Well, what I'm going to start off with is gunplay. gunplay. Because this is something very different for you guys, right? So we're not used to seeing yes. shooters from CD Projekt Red. So how did, you, how did you begin putting together the gunplay and deciding how you wanted it to feel, how you wanted it to play out? So, well, as you mentioned, we haven't done like on FPS at all in, in, in the past, but it's not like that our designers are not familiar with the subject, right? We're playing games as well. People that the gameplay designers are doing their games themselves either at home or they were just doing FPSs before they joined Cyberpunk. Also, we acquired talent from the industry in order to grow our team accordingly to do this exact project we uh, envision. And this is how we ended up with pretty good gunplay as far as I can see in the demo. Yeah, I have to say from what I've seen, it looks <laughs> epic <laughs> so um i guess i've noticed that in in interviews previously you guys have said that you don't want this to just be an fps though and i think again that's evident in in the demo you know we've seen lots of different ways of very creatively taking down enemies so if you're not a first person shooter person if you if that's not something you enjoy well, what can you look forward to that's exactly what you're saying we are not actually an fps we are we are a hardcore rpg right like this is first and foremost on story driven rpg with shooting elements, let's put it that way, because, well, we are playing in the Cyberpunk universe, 2077, there are guns around, so why shouldn't you use a gun? You are using a gun. But uh, your gunplay, how you are using the weapon, which, which weapons you are able to use, is all influenced by the attributes, the skill sets that you are acquired through the game. So think nothing less when it comes to RPG elements in The Witcher. And while, and by tying those two things together, we hope that Cyberpunk will be a very enjoyable RPG shooter element experience. So let's break down those attributes, because as you said, you can kind of very heavily customize your character. You've got yeah. not only the life paths, but you've also got the attributes and you know, you've got the, 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 the skills, the steel perks, tree. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what, what kind of, what can you change? What are we customizing? When I'm changing all these various elements, just how different can I be as a character? Well, that's a very broad question, but let's <laughs> uh, simplify it down to this. So first and foremost, you are creating your own character, right? You are uh, shaping how he looks, uh, how he sounds, like you're choosing his backstory. And later on, while playing the game, you are actually developing your skills by, well, by playing the game as you want it to be. Let's say if you want to be uh, a guy who walks you know, with a shotgun into every uh, single action scene. If you're using this shotgun, then your shotgun skill gets leveled up accordingly. The thing here is that to each skill perk, there is an attribute mapped. Let's, let's say, let's say, it's an example, that for the shotgun skill, strength is like the attribute of choice, the, the, the mapped attribute. So you can level up your shotgun, but not higher than the amount the attribute currently has. Mm. So if you want to go up higher in your shotgun skill, then it would be a good idea to level up your, your strength attribute, right? And uh, this will allow the player to shape the character while playing the game. And so if I change my mind halfway through, you know, how restricted am I going to be by the choices I've made previously? There is always like a way to, you can, you know, you can drop, drop the shotguns and go full sniper rifles and then start leveling up this one. So we don't want to you know, funnel uh, a player in, down into a path that he might later regret. There will be always a path in order to... Well, it's it's like in life, right? If you are a, a doctor half of your life, but at one point you decide you want to become a bestseller author, and let's just start writing because this is the way you are leveling up your skills, right? You are still a doctor, but in another 20 years time, you might be also a bestseller author. I like that. <laughs> That's like the perfect way to explain it. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the city. Because again, yeah. this is something that I think 
I'm really excited about how it feels both familiar and yet like a new space because we all know what cyberpunk as a genre looks like. We all know what we want to see, but at the same time, you don't want it to feel too familiar. You don't want it to feel boring. So how have you how have you given it that edge that makes it feel very you know definitive to this game? Well, I personally like uh, see the cyberpunk genre as like as horror, right? You have different kinds of horror. You have sci-fi horror. You have other horrors. I'm not a particular uh, <laughs> professional in horror, <laughs> but uh, with Cyberpunk 2077, we are making our own take of Cyberpunk, built upon Cyberpunk 2020 by Mike Pondsmith, done in the 1980s. Um, but we are giving it our own flair. We want to put the punk back into Cyberpunk uh, through music, through the characters, how the world is built up. So there will be obviously common elements like oppressive corporations, obviously, like poverty and those in the middle struggling what to do with their life. But I sincerely believe that Cyberpunk 2077 will be y unique in this niche. And so something else that's in the city are the gangs, are the different factions. So tell us a little bit about those and how they'll shape our experience through the city. The gangs are a very prominent element in the city. Um, I don't remember how many there are, but like four or five, something like that. Maybe even per district would make sense, actually. Um, they are part of the story. They are appearing there. Also in other uh, activities in the open world, you will be in contact with them. You will have merchants tied to them. So one gang might sell you something that another gang is not selling. You might sell one particular item at a better price to one particular gang that needs this item for a better price than at a gang that doesn't need this item. Etc. 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 So they are prominent in the world and they are prominent in the game. They are an integral element. And is the, is that the same for the corporations? Because I think obviously in the in the demo we saw last year, you know, we did see what what was a, a very frightening corporation come in towards the end of that. The, uh, I would put it this way: the corporations are like those this this ominous creature looming above everything, right? It's it's easier to get into trouble like on the street with a gang than actually get into like a higher up corporation and you know, start just talking to people. If you start asking around in shady parts of the town around some people like in the real world, then you probably find some gang associates. But in order to get up to the CEO in Coca-Cola, you just don't walk up in there, right? So it's, it's kind of a bit of a difference. But the corporations are very prominent as well. They are like shaping how the whole, the whole night city, how the whole world in Cyberpunk looks like. And we are struggling against that. So they are as prominent, but in a bit different way. So you mentioned quests with the gang. So just quests in general, you know, that's something that you guys are really known for. You're known for having, you know, not quite such a separation between side quests and campaign. They often mm -hmm. feel much kind of a more woven into the story yeah. so is that something we're going to see here and what, what kind of quests are we going to be looking uh, at absolutely the, the thing we are trying to do with the side quests is that we always when it fits we we like to introduce those first uh, breadcrumbs to the side quest in the main path like we're introducing a character that might not get fleshed out in the main game in the main path but there will be a side quest connected to it you might get interested in what is he up to like what is his problem can we help him? Do we want to help him? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the other hand, you have all those activities happening in the city, uh, which are, for instance, uh, contracts that we get from our fixer. We are a mercenary, we need money. So what are we doing? We are calling up our fixer, like, hey, hook me up with a quest that gives me a street story that gives me a bunch of, you know, eddies. And in those, we also get in touch with, as mentioned gangs also with corporations sometimes there will be contracts given out by corporations they are not saying that directly because corporations <laughs> don't do that they are good guys right but we are the guys who are doing the things that they find too messy to deal with directly so we did see you know the mission that we saw in the demo you are kind of doing somebody's dirty work for them which uh, i really in liked. in the demo which one was that so we were uh, we were working with i think the, the voodoo, voodoo boys, boys. And yeah, then, yeah. yeah oh so yes of course we are I said it like 
they weren't present in the main game. Of course they are yes, present in the yeah, main game. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, of, so, course, of course, of course. So the thing I loved about this was we saw it from two different perspectives. So in the demo, we, yeah, we, we see switched, kind of... Right? Yeah, so it's, it's the high intelligence, the Netrunner-style character. Yeah. And then my favourite, which is like the <laughs> smash yeah, 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 everything, yeah, yeah. you know, I, rip I, I figured off. as much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so do you have a favourite weapon? Because we saw such a variety. If I have a favourite weapon. Uh, I have a favourite type of weapon yeah. in the game. It's like uh, the smart guns, which are like targeting people. It's probably not a weapon I would use in the game if I would uh, use it if I would play it myself, because those guns are they are like you are pinpointing a guy on the map, like on the on the on the screen, and all your shots that you're firing are hitting him. But you don't have that much of control if you are hitting like leg, body, or head. Uh. If you're using you know a manual weapon, a normal weapon, then you actually can rely on your skill and make those headshots count, right? To get headshot, headshot, headshot. But it looks so good if those <laughs> bullets are just <laughs> flying around and doing a. It is really nice, yeah. This was actually part of the demo last year. Mm. Well, as you said, it looks so cool. And I think that's one of the things that's so striking is it is just this beautiful world. So, how difficult is that to achieve? technically because obviously you can decide this is how we want it to look but then you've still got to give it to a team to make it actually happen i sincerely don't know how our programmers made it happen <laughs> i mean there were those ideas that this will look this way this will look this way i was like oh, all right those are good ideas but let's see if this is going to work out and then it worked out and i'm like and this is running on a normal machine and like, hey, it's working on a normal machine like oh all right okay cool i mean <laughs> awesome work so no but jokes aside like um we had to improve our engine after The Witcher. It's not even about that the engine was worse, it was different. It was suited for a different kind of game. It was TPP, uh, we didn't have that high verticality uh, buildings. Uh, there wasn't that much detail, there wasn't that much light actually. And this is one of the things that we were focusing on, like with our global illumination system. We want to make sure that every light that bounces off a, a wall actually colorizes like when it bounces back off again. I mean, it's really complex. I when I first, first heard about this, I wasn't even aware that if a light source, you know, I mean, I haven't thought about it like saying, yeah. like, if it bounces on a wall, then actually this wall is emitting light as well. So it's actually influencing how this uh, sofa is looking like. And it really makes a difference in the game, especially if you have, you know, an, a night, a night city at night, mm. night city at night, <laughs> uh, with all those neons around. Uh, it's not just about building a city; it's about making a city that makes you go well, like Hugo. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a fair thing to say. <laughs> and so, how do you make a city feel so lived in? I think that's another thing: is it does feel like a city with a history. It really feels like you're wandering through a story. You know, you can see what happened in each district so where what do you think about to make it look that way two factors Mike Pondsmith's work in Cyberpunk 2020 it eased it up certainly <laughs> uh, this is why we we, we uh, wanted to cooperate with him on that because we really liked the setting it was interesting for us to implement a major story in it and the second uh, key part is a very date very dedicated open world team who well learned their lesson, uh, learned their lessons on The Witcher, and who makes sure that each space in the city is there for a reason, that it's feeling lived in, and on top of that, we all obviously have the environment team that is well shaping a city realistically. So, for fans of The Witcher. Yes. What are they going to recognize here? What are they going to feel as that CD Projekt Red feel about the game? All right, that's a good question. I would answer that in The Witcher 1 and 2, we wanted and well achieved as far as we heard the community, uh, a very immersing story. What we did in The Witcher 3 was to add uh, an open world on top of that story to make the person, the, the player, be able to walk around, do quests in a different like uh, order and so on. And um, and in Cyberpunk, we are adding a third layer with the open and the gameplay. You can customize your own character. You can shape how it's being played. You are not Geralt anymore with two swords. You can 
You can be the guy with two swords, but you can also <laughs> be the guy with a sniper rifle, the shotgun, or your bare fists. <laughs> and um, I think what the Witcher fans should expect from Cyberpunk that we are not letting go of this immersive story and the open world elements. And so when it comes to story, how difficult was it to choose what you took from Mike Pondsmith's work? So obviously, there's just so much of it. Well, from well, we didn't take the story itself, right? Yes. This, this was a plot that we developed uh, in strong cooperation w with Mike. When it comes to the world, it was more about well, we, we took we took everything that was happening in 2020. Yeah. But the challenge was that we are we were actually adding 57 years to that, right? So the challenge was to come up with. Uh, with a time skip that allowed us to shape our story in a way that it's like set 57 years in the future while still addressing things that were happening in, uh, in the core game of Cyberpunk 2020. And um, that was probably the, the biggest challenge. Later on, we developed our plot and shaped our quests and one of it you saw. <laughs> so how does it feel to see it kind of in this state? Because obviously this is a game that we've been waiting for yeah. forever, it feels like. You know, it's something that we've had it's teased a while. and teased It's a while. It's a little, 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 little. Bit. Yeah, a while. <laughs> <laughs> but it feels amazing to finally see this kind of really, obviously it's not the entire game, but see a really polished, finished yes, version that yes, is yes, a game yes, we're watching yes. somebody play. So how does it feel for you to kind of see it in that state? Actually, I think it feels pretty similar uh, to what you are feeling because, well, when you're developing a game, you are not doing quest by quest to alpha to beta quality to polish quality, right? You are like developing it evenly, like you're drafting everything out and doing alpha, pre-beta, beta polish. So if we're, when we are doing these materials for the E3 where we are picking out some slides of the game in order to polish out to see like our end product, we want our end product to look like this, it gives us a sense of like it's comforting us that we are actually seeing it. All right, this is actually working. This is looking in insanely good. It's playing insanely well. And now we just have to do this. There are too many quests in this game. <laughs> <laughs> All right, finally, final question. Yeah. If you were going to shape your character in All this right. game, where are you? Where are you putting points? What attributes are you going? Which life path? Life path. All right, I, I really like that. <laughs> I know, I know. I, know, I, know I, I, I would pick the corporal life path because uh, I, no. uh, I'm, I'm somewhat, you know, I, before I came into the industry, I was like doing consulting strategy oh, and okay. stuff like that. I was actually wearing a tie, <laughs> and uh, it, it somewhat resembles my life, life path as well. Attribute points, I don't know exactly. I would have to actually focus on. I'm a min maxer, right? I have yeah. to just. All right, those weapons require those things. I need this. But certainly I would go with a lot of cool. <laughs> I mean, you don't even need to put points in that. Look how cool you are already. Yeah, but the game doesn't know that. We're not <laughs> there yet. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, thank you so much. This was absolutely brilliant. We uh, loved watching the demo and I just... I'm I, glad to hear It's ridiculous how excited I am for this and I'm <laughs> glad to hear that you are as excited as I am. I am, I'm certainly... <laughs> Thank you so much. No, not at all. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed that. We are just, oh, we can't wait for this. The demo was absolutely fantastic. I hope you enjoyed this interview. And if you liked it, make sure to like it and subscribe and hit that notification bell to make sure you stay up to date with everything from the world of PlayStation Access. For the players.